What does compassion have to do with the soil of your heart? Hello and welcome to your THP online community. I'm Dallas, your online community pastor. Today, our lead pastor, Scott Etheridge, will be continuing our series, Matters of the Heart, with a message called Disruptive Compassion. This was a great message that challenged the people in the congregation to take time to say something very specific in their own personal prayer time. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And the power that comes with taking time to truly listen to the Lord is transformative. It challenges the individual to take a deeper look at the world around them. Because when God speaks, there is compassion. Amen. I want you to open up to Mark chapter 13 today. We have been in this message series for the last few weeks called Matters of the Heart. And we have been taking from the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13. And we have talked about the wayside, which is kind of that hard and hard ground. And we talked about the, the rocky soil. Uh, but some revelation we got out of the rocky soil was, you know, some of those stones that are in that soil, they're useful. We can crush those things and we can put them back in the ground and God can use it to heal us. They can become stepping stones. We have talked about the thorns, man, that just choke out that word. And, you know, we really kind of talked about being filled with the Holy Spirit last week and how being filled with the Holy Spirit actually chokes out the thorns that try to choke out the word that God has given to us. Today, I, I, I want to talk today Yes, about good ground, and we're going to hit good ground even a little more next week. But today, I, I, I want to take a little turn on good ground. So Matthew chapter 13, verse 3. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. And some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them, but others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And here's the key in verse 9. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 18. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, when the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart, this is he who received the seed by the wayside. So Jesus is explaining the parable, and he says, but who, he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now, he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So the word here says, Jesus says, he who receives the seed on good ground, the good soil of your heart, and you hear the word, and you understand the word, it will bear fruit, and he says a hundredfold, 60 and some 30. Now, Mark chapter 4, verse 20. But these are the ones sown on good ground, those who hear the word, accept it. And bear fruit. So we're not just hearing the word and just accepting the word, but then we're using the word. It's bearing fruit in our eyes, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. Luke chapter 8, verse 15 says, But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. How many of you know if you're going to bear fruit, you got to have patience? Amen. Because it's not always going to happen immediately. Like it's not always, the fruit's not always going to be there right away. It's not always just going to uh, uh, appear. But it's going to take time. It takes time for that. And we learned in this parable that good soil 
is all about our hearts, keeping our hearts pure, maintaining childlike faith, trust, and innocence. One of the reasons why I love to watch our kids worship is because there's such a sincerity there. I know we can look at them and we can say, well, you know, they hit somebody with that flag or, you know, they're running around or they're doing circles or they're doing cartwheels or whatever we say. Well, look at them. They just don't know yet. Well, I would to God that they would never know. If it means they just become versions of somebody else. I would to God that they would always keep that childlike heart, that childlike faith. Well, why should I do that, Scott? Mark chapter 10, verse 15. It's right there. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a what? Wow, that was horrible. As a what? Will by no means enter it. If you don't receive the kingdom of God as a little child, you can by no means enter it. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, it says this, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Jesus gives us this amazing key in the parable, and that is this, protect the soil of your heart. And the key to that, ears to hear. We have one of the greatest examples of having ears to hear in the prophet Samuel who prayed a seven-word prayer. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. That seven-word prayer changed everything in the life of this prophet. It changed everything. It didn't change his surroundings. The prophet Samuel, he may have been raised up in the priesthood and he may have been raised up in all that, but he was raised up by a corrupt priesthood. It wasn't that the people around him were good at all. They weren't. And he says, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Lord, I want to hear your voice. I want to hear what you're saying, Lord. And no matter what's going on around me, I want to walk that out. I want to bear fruit in that. No matter what's coming against me, no matter who's around me, no matter what my scenario is, no matter what my situation is, I may have been thrown away. I may have been under a ton of rubble. I may be in a situation I never intended to be. And maybe I'm in a situation right now because of my own decisions. But God, speak. I am listening. More than 50 years ago, Dr. Alfred Alfred Tomatis was confronted with an issue he had never encountered. A famed opera singer had lost his ability to hit certain notes, although the notes were within his vocal range. The experts had no cure. So Dr. Tomatis had a hunch. Using a sonometer, he discovered the average opera singer produced 140 decibel uh, decimal sound waves at a meter's distance, slightly louder than a military jet taking off. And the sound is even louder in one's head. And here was his diagnosis. The singer was deafened by his own voice. Selective muteness was caused by selective deafness. And the doctor said that the voice can only reproduce what the ear can hear. It is now called the Tomatis effect. Is it possible that what we perceive as relational, emotional, and spiritual problems are actually a hearing problem? Ears that have been deafened to the voice of God causes us to lose our voice. And it moves us towards the wayside of the hard ground, a hard heart. Because learning to hear the voice of God, listen, learning to hear the voice of God can solve thousands of problems. Learning to tune in to the voice of God can solve thousands of problems. Why? Because his voice is love. His voice is power. His voice is healing. His voice is wisdom. His voice is joy. And his voice is compassion. Because in a culture that is bent towards fear and isolation, we have to be intentional to guard our hearts. We live in a culture that leans toward fear and isolation. Now we can say, well, that's just a product of 2020. It's because of this, this, and this. And and this illness or this virus or this thing or this societal issue or this governmental issue or this. And we can apply it to a lot of different things. But can I tell you, since the beginning of time, there has been sickness and there has been illnesses. And there have been illnesses that have brought death. Some of you in this room right now 
If you would have contracted polio after you were born, you were dead. Some of you remember that. Some of you remember that if you would have caught a fever in the days you were born, you would have died. Some of you, something very simple that today, maybe just a pill or just maybe a quick, maybe going to quick care, boom, it's done, would have killed someone in the 20s and 30s. It would have brought death. So it's not just a 2020 issue, it's always been there, which means the word of God has something to say about it. It's always been a part. And in this culture of of fear and isolation, we have to be careful to guard our hearts. Because when we give in to fear and isolation, our hearts move toward the wayside. We have less compassion, more judgment, and more cynicism. Many want their voice heard, without having much to say. And that comes from the fallout of doing so little listening. The best way to get people to listen to us is for us to listen to God. Why? Because we'll have something worth listening to then. There are too many echoes in our society and not enough voices. There's too much regurgitation of information and not speaking forth of revelation. We've all become an expert in a category that we have no clue about because of Facebook. We see somebody post an article and all of a sudden we put our little thing on it and we shoot it out as if we wrote it. Hey, look what I just discovered. You didn't discover anything. We were scrolling, and we saw it. It interested us, and we thought, oh, well, my friends and my fans and my followers, they'll love this. Let, Let me throw this out on my page, right? We have all these echoes happening. No one can hear the truth because there's just echoes. There's no true voices. True prophetic voices. When I say true prophetic voices, I'm not talking about craziness or weirdness. I'm talking about prophetic voices. I'm talking about voices that speak as the oracles of God. And when we bring it down to its, its, its common denominator within the church, the body of Jesus, we should be the ones that have something to say. Jesus understood to fulfill his mission He had to listen to the Father. And his compassion flowed from his heart, which was one with the Father. So where did his compassion flow from? It flowed from heaven. But heaven came down and got into his heart and flowed out of his heart, and that's where the compassion came from. And it's the same today. To fulfill his mission, we listen. And then we grow our capacity for compassion. Because that will always begin and end with our hearts. When we transitioned the identity of our missions kind of reach from the healing place to THP compassion, that was intentional. And I know that sometimes just a simple change can throw us off off base. I remember like people would go, what is THP compassion? Where's missions? (laughs) What's THP compassion? Why is it THP compassion? Well, aren't we being compassionate? (laughs) Isn't that what that is? It's not just missions. It's compassion. We're growing our capacity to be compassionate. We're listening to God, and we're growing in that compassion because true compassion comes from a healthy heart. Be who God created you to be, identity. That's about the heart. Know what God is saying. you got to listen. And then do what God says. You gotta be obedient. God has called us to what Hal, Don- Hal Donaldson calls disruptive compassion. Disruptive compassion. See, true compassion makes us uncomfortable, it interrupts our regularly scheduled broadcast, it disrupts our ordinary, busy lives. And it reprioritizes what we think is important. 
Matthew chapter 14, verse 13 says this. When Jesus heard it, he departed. When Jesus heard what? When he heard that John the Baptist had been beheaded. That's what he hears. He hears that his, his cousin, but his forerunner, the one who prepared the way for him, is dead. That's what Jesus hears. So he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. Now, how many of you know that in order for him to really feel and know everything we go through, Jesus had to go through it? Is that not right? Our infirmities, our, our difficulties, sickness, all those things he had to deal with in some measure. To totally feel what we feel. He had to feel what it means to lose somebody that you love. Right? He had to feel that. So that he would understand how we feel on maybe what we think is our worst day on this planet, which is the death of somebody we love. Right? Jesus hears it and he departs. He, he's going to get away to a deserted place by himself. But here's what the word of God says. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. When they heard what? When they heard that John the Baptist. So now they're hurting and they're confused. When they heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude and he was moved with compassion for them. And healed their sick. Jesus was tired. And he probably did not want to deal with sick humanity. He probably wanted to just go somewhere and cry. Have you ever wanted to just go somewhere and cry? Anyone today? Cynicism will dull your heart. And dry up the tears and try to convince you it's okay. Jesus just wanted to get away and pray to the Father and say, Father, here's this grief. You got to take this from me. And we know what happened after that. What did he do? He healed all those people, and then what happened? He fed 4,000. <laughs> He's still grieving, it hasn't changed. How do we know that? Because when they feed the 4,000, what does he do? He goes out to a secluded place now and prays. What kept him from getting to the secluded place in the first place was his compassion. It disrupted his grief. Come on. It disrupted his schedule. No, you don't understand, Father. I've got to go somewhere, and I've got to cry, and I've got to get rid of my grief. I've lost somebody. I don't have anything to give these people. And the Father's point in that wasn't that, Jesus, you have something to give them. It's I have something to do through you to them. Some of the most powerful times of ministry you will ever have were moments where you're completely empty. Why? Why? Because you'll have nothing to give. And when you have nothing to give, guess what? It has to come from somewhere. And that's where the anointing of the Holy Spirit comes in. Amen? Disruptive compassion. It will push us to reach down inside to places within us maybe we don't want to admit are there and let God heal us. And I'm just telling you today, I need to go to those places myself. Well, Scott, you went and you had meetings with Convoy of Hope, and they told you some you know, sad stories, and now you're all jacked up. No, this message was done before that. The only thing interjected in this message is the term disruptive compassion. Because I've been going into a deep place of myself going, man, God, I need to grow my capacity for disruptive compassion. And here's what I've asked myself. God, how many times have I used the word wisdom as an excuse not to flow in the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Well, Gerald has a virus. Everybody stay away from him. You know, I'm going to use wisdom. I don't need to be around Gerald at all. I'm just going to use wisdom because my family doesn't need it and the church doesn't need it and nobody needs it. So, Gerald, you're on your own. Outside the gate, my friend. Go. Nobody needs it. You know what those were called in the Bible? Lepers. The unclean. You know who brought them inside the gate? 
Who? Who was it? Jesus. We live in this culture of of fear and isolationism, and if we were to just sit down and talk to somebody and say, hey, would you ever do this to a person? We might say, no way, I would never do that. But when we get caught up in the culture, when we get caught up in everything that's being thrown at us, it begins to move us not to good ground, but to the wayside. That I've got to grow my capacity for disruptive compassion. It's not enough to be comfortable with the status quo of Scott's life. And I say, God, help me. Because true compassion touches the untouchable and reaches the unreachable and it obliterates fear and brings light to isolation. Helen Keller said this, we may have found a cure for most evils, but we have found no remedy for the worst of them all, the apathy of human beings. Apathy is a disease that attacks the nervous system. It dulls your emotions and it hardens your heart. And it leaves the world with fewer voices speaking from a pure heart. Let me tell you today, you can call this a prophetic word or not, or you can call it the worst sermon you've ever heard. doesn't matter to me, but I am speaking prophetically today. We are at a crossroads as the children of God. In a culture driven by fear, the church itself has become dulled and lulled to sleep as to what is available to us in Christ. Compassion is about hearing with a pure heart And then acting with clean hands. Because disruptive compassion understands the healing a simple touch can bring. Do you know how much healing there is in human contact? You know how much healing just in human contact. I'm not talking about latex and skin. I'm talking about skin to skin. Matthew chapter 9, verse 18. While he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshiped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. Verse 19. And just keep rolling, guys, as we go. So Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And suddenly, a woman who had a flow, disruptive. He's on his way to, to lay his hands on somebody else, and now here's this disruption. And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind him. Now, a flow of blood for 12 years means she is what? Unclean, outside, no touch. Everybody avoid her, stay away from her. The Bible says she had a flow of blood for how long? 12 years, no touch. 12 years, no touch. Doctors took everything she had, no cure. No touch. Came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. Next verse. For she said to herself, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around and when he saw her, he said, be of good cheer, daughter. Daughter. We don't even know what her name was. She was the woman with the issue of blood. She doesn't even have a name. Her issue became her name. Her identity, and what's the first thing Jesus does? Daughter, be who God created you to be, identity. That's the first thing he restores. Your faith has made you well, and the woman was made well from that hour. When Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing, why is it sometimes that we clear a room when we pray for somebody in the hospital? Because not everybody in that room believes. Did you know sometimes I'll go into a hospital room and the person who's in the bed will ask me to empty the room. Now, you want to be uncomfortable? Go into a room and tell a bunch of strangers that they have to leave the room of their loved one. I walked into a room and the person in the bed said, Pastor Scott, if you would please tell that one, that one, that one, that one, they've got to leave the room because they don't have any faith. Why don't you tell them? (laughs) Disruptive compassion. Right? He said to them, make room for the girl is not dead. They were all there almost celebrating her death. 
declaring it, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. Let me tell you something. When you function in disruptive compassion, people will make fun of you. People will ridicule you. But when the crowd was put outside, but when the crowd was put outside, everybody thinks it's all about drawing a crowd. It's never been about drawing a crowd. It's always been about the one. It's always been about the disciples. It's always been around the small ones that woke up near the fire with him every single morning and the crowd only came when they wanted something from him. But when the crowd was put outside, he went in and what did he do? He took her by the hand. Jesus didn't spritz up and glove up and walk in. Took her by the hand. Well, she was dead, so there's no communicable disease. It's fine. And the girl arose. Like Jesus is, is, is reaching out and he's, he's touching. Verse 26. And the report of this went out into all the land. Boom. Verse 35. Do we have that, guys? Do we have that, guys? Verse 35. All right, let me find it. Do we have it? Matthew 9, 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, again, here he is. He was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered and sheep having no shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Luke chapter five, verse 12. Do we have that, guys? Are we locked up? Just give me a signal. I'll move on. Okay. And it happened when he was in a certain city that behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus full of leprosy. And he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Next verse. Then he put out his hand. How many of you know that Jesus didn't necessarily have to do that? He put out his hand and touched him. Full of leprosy, touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him. Luke chapter 6, verse 17. And he came down with them, stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples, a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases. Verse 18. As well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits. And they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to what? Touch him. For power went out from him and he healed them all. Like everybody's looking for a touch, to, to touch Jesus. John 13, Jesus touches the disciples by washing their feet when they should have been washing his feet, but he was washing their feet. Acts chapter three, lame man at the gate. Silver and gold have I not, but such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. I'm a, all right, I've done my duty. No, he reaches down and pulls the man up. Acts chapter 5, verse 12, the laying on of hands and through the hands of the apostles. And through the what? Hands of the apostles. Many signs and wonders were done among the people and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Acts chapter 9, Ananias hands on Paul. If you've ever read Acts chapter 9, put yourself in Ananias' shoes. He's going to a man who's just been at the stoning death of Stephen. Stephen. And has persecuted and maybe sent out contracts, hits on Christians. And God says, Ananias, hey, you remember that guy? <laughs> Slaughtering all those people? Go to him and lay your hands on him. He goes and he lays his hands on him and the scales fall from his eyes. Peter with Cornelius, he's not even supposed to be touching him. He's not even supposed to be in his house. Acts chapter 19, verse 11, by the hands of Paul. Now God worked unusual miracles by what? The hands of Paul. Touch. 
throughout the churches in the New Testament. And Jesus says, greater things will you do in my name. Greater things than these will you do in my name. Why did Jesus say greater things that we would do? Because ultimately, it would go on from that moment until he returns. Which means the numbers who would be healed after would be more than what Jesus did when he was alive on earth. Yesterday I was in Kroger. I, I, I love it when God does this. Like when I, when I know what I'm going to talk about on a Sunday and then the day before God it just like puts a... It's right there. We walked into Kroger. The first thing I see when I walk into Kroger is a woman coming in the produce and she's got a mask on. And I could hear her cough in the mask and it was deep. I mean, it was, it was rough. And everybody moved away from her. Now she was conscious of where she was in the produce section. She even put her hand over the mask while she was in that area. And then once she kind of slid out of that area a little bit, she brought it down a little bit to breathe. And I walked behind her. I mean, she probably thought I was stalking her or whatever. But I kept a safe distance. <laughs> and I was just like, Lord, would it be that, that I could just go up and just, can I just walk up to her and say, hey, can I just pray for you? And we were, we were about to go around this corner and I was right behind her. I was just praying the Holy Spirit. And as we turned the corner, I just felt the Holy Spirit say, nope. And as I looked down the aisle, Tanya was standing right there. And I was like, oh, okay. So I just walked to Tanya. And I never, it was as if the woman disappeared. I didn't see her after that. We were all over the store for, for, for a long time. I never saw her again. Long time in the store for me is like 15 minutes. So maybe it wasn't that long. <laughs> But the moment I saw her, my heart just began to weep because people just scattered. And there she was, just all alone, watching all the people scatter away from her. It was evident. Couldn't hide it. They were getting away from her. If we as the body of Christ give in to what the world is feeding us, fear and isolation, we are walking right into the open door that the enemy has laid for us. He walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And you know what he really wants to devour in you? Your faith and your hope. Because the word of God is clear. The devil really is. He's afraid of what you can become. He's afraid of that. Because if you get to the point, And I've done some things that probably weren't wise. And I probably tested God at times. And I had to ask forgiveness for that. Being in different foreign countries and different things. And eating things. And laying hands on people. And being in places. And. You know, one of the smartest things let me re-say that. <laughs> I'll say ignorant and not stupid. One of the most ignorant things that I've done was I went into an isolation room in um, Willis Knight in Pyramont. No gloves. Um, they had, somebody had called me their child was in Piermont, and they were in isolation. Like that whole area, the hospital was in lockdown. They weren't letting anybody over in that area. I came, told them who I was. Mother had called me, and I wanted to go in, and I wanted to pray for the person. So they told me all the stuff. I walked in, and I had all the stuff, and I felt like the Holy Spirit said, skin on skin. I took the gloves off. I took the mask down. I walked up to the bed. Now, the child of this person was an adult. And he said, what are you doing here? Like, nobody's been here. They won't let anybody in here. And I said, well, your mom called and I'm here. So 
and I'm here to pray for you. And he was like, okay, go ahead. And I was on the other side of the room. I said, no, I've come to pray for you. And I walked up, and I laid my hands on his forehead. And it was sweat, everything. I just laid my hands on his forehead. And, man, I just began to call down some things in that room and upon his life. And I prayed for him, and I prayed for him, and I prayed in the Spirit. I don't know where he stood on in the Spirit, but I prayed in the Spirit. Because I can promise you, if he had a problem with praying in the Spirit and the condition he was in, he didn't. He needed a miracle. He needed God to move in his life. The moment I touched him, he started to cry because he had not had skin on skin for almost three weeks. Everybody who touched him, there was something between their skin and him. And he began to cry. And I know as soon as I touched him, just the touch began the healing. And I prayed for him, and within a couple days, he was out of it. He was out of there. He had nothing. It was gone. They didn't give him a treatment to remove it. The Holy Spirit, God moved in that guy's life and removed that from his body. It could have been Logan. It could have been Matt. It could have been Jenny. It could have been Gerald. It could have been Jaron, Sierra, whoever walking in that room and that touch. The touch isn't accounted to the person. It's accounted to the Lord. Because it's not in our name that we do it. It's in the name of Jesus that we do it. Because ultimately, disruptive compassion, here's what it's all about. Hope. Refuse to lose it. God has given us hope. (laughs) We're not freaked out like the world because we don't have that same spirit. Because the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead doesn't mean that you're not going to find hand sanitizer in this church. But it does mean I'm not looking for that when you have a need. That's not the first thing I'm looking for. The world is hurting, but something can always be done. So many times we get to the place where like, whatever I'll do, it's just going to be a drop in the bucket. It'll never matter. Everything you do in Jesus' name matters. The status quo is overrated. Better is better and possible is possible. Sacrifice is not a burden. Always do the next kind thing. Love simply. God and one another. Tomorrow doesn't excuse today. It depends on it. And I want you to hear this, especially in the culture we're living in right now. Hatred has no kingdom value. Someone's sinfulness is no excuse for your meanness. It's amazing how when we look at somebody else, we forget our own sinfulness. Because how are you bringing them out of that sinfulness by just being mean? Being kind does not mean that we agree with everything that everybody does. And I'm telling you, I, I've got I've to deal with this in my own heart. My own heart. In me. Expect obstacles and keep moving forward. And become revolutionary. These are those who have turned the world upside down. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. So probably the question is, have you heard him? Or has your voice been dulled by the lack of listening? Edwin Cruz, God didn't call you to be an echo. Clint, God didn't call you to be an echo. He called you to have a voice, a revolutionary voice that speaks counter to what the world is telling itself. There is no hope. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. (laughs) There is hope because hope deferred will make you sick, man, but when the desire is fulfilled, it's a tree of life. It's going to grow and it's going to bear fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100-fold. But compassion will disrupt your life. And it will make things inconvenient. 
And I have to ask the Lord for forgiveness in my own heart for those things. Those moments when he's got a woman at the well right there or he's got a leper standing before me and my first thought is, man, I've got to get to this. Man, I've got to do this. Man, if I don't get this done today. Was I created to get things done or was I created to bring the kingdom to earth? And I know we can do both of them. Sometimes one is used as an excuse for not doing the other. I've had to look at my own heart and say, God, how many times have I said wisdom, wisdom, wisdom? And I didn't really mean wisdom. I just meant I'll use wisdom as an excuse not to step out. You want your lost family and friends to see you or see Jesus? Because if they see Jesus in you, it changes everything. (laughs) But it also disrupts everything. Amanda, I want to come to the river, please. Can you do that for me? Matt, however you guys want to do that with a team or however you want to do it, it's fine. <sighs> Lord, we are listening today. Speak, Lord for your servant is listening. Lord, I pray today as we've come into this place that, Lord, that we haven't just done this just to do it. Just another service. Just another moment. Just another thing added to our schedule of things. But I pray that today, as we've come in this place, no matter how we came in, that there's been something stirred up inside of us today for we have been listening. Lord, in that good ground, that good soil, there is, there's a compassion that lies in that good soil. That compassion, true compassion, comes from a healthy heart. And so, Lord, if we're here today and maybe our hearts are not healthy, maybe we've bought into the fear and the isolationism. Forgive us, Lord. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And we are, li- we are not like those who have no hope. I pray right now you restore hope where there is a hopeless feeling in their hearts. Restore peace where there's been just chaos and confusion. Just bring that peace right now in Jesus' name. God, where there's been fear and just that feeling, that anxious feeling of fear, I pray for power, love, and a sound mind right now in Jesus' name. Where there are hearts that maybe have been influenced by judgment and cynicism, Lord, may you begin to to move in those hearts, bring those hearts toward the good soil. God, you didn't create us to be cynical, mean humans. We love you because you first loved us and you created us in your own image. And we may not have a full grasp of that understanding. We may feel inferior many times and we should because you're God. But at the same time, 
in that knowledge that you are God and we are not. You are creator and we are the created in that we have an authority that you have given us, Father, through Christ Jesus. In the heavenly realms, you've given us an authority to tear down strongholds. You've given us an authority to to have peace that crushes the schemes of wickedness from the enemy. That you've given us an armor to wear, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, that the gospel of peace is on our feet. The truth is girded around our waist. So that we can walk in the power and the authority of Christ. Lord, I pray for those people today that feel isolated. Maybe even by their own choices or maybe not those that feel isolated. Those that are here today that that it may have been just a, a post that somebody posted. It may have been just a comment somebody made that now has put fear into their hearts and their lives. Pray that you would just fill them right now with your presence. church, if we don't get this right with the next steps that we're taking in this world, in our nation, if we don't get this right, the spirit of this age is not stopping. It's continuing to come at us. And it's going to keep coming. But we've been given the word of God. We've been given prayer. We've been given the gifts of the spirit. We've been given the opportunity to produce the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Not to combat those things, but to destroy those things. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And in him there is life and life more abundant. To the leper, we say, come. To the woman with the issue of blood, we say, come. God, today we receive your invitation to come and lay ourselves before you and say, Lord, I just... just need some heart surgery today. need to grow my capacity for compassion. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this podcast. If you have been challenged by the message that was just given, maybe you feel a burden and you would like for us to pray with you, please feel free to reach out to us. You can find us on any of our social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just look for THP Shreveport. Also, feel free to email us at mediahub at thpshreport.com. Thank you so much for being part of our THP online community.